Well, here we are in the Greater Sydney region, still in lockdown. And I must admit, being in lockdown is not easy, is it? But I feel for those around the world more so who are not getting access to health care or who are cut off from family, as some of us might be, or even having children at home during the school holidays can be tiring and taxing, especially for those who lose income or security we feel and pray for them especially. The risk in these times, it seems to me, is that we can buy into a sense of victimhood or we can go back to such a sense about ourselves, especially if life has dealt us some rough blows. The risk is that our sense of victimhood can lead us also to look to others to blame or to scapegoat for our situation other ethnic groups, for example, or immigrants. We can then also take it out on shopkeepers, can't we, who insist we wear masks or feel we can flout societal rules because of some sense of entitlement, because as victims we are owed something. But yes, there are real victims in this and other times. There is injustice and depression, inequality and exclusion, and people being victimised. But where can we get psychic and social health for strength? Well, of course, we always need to seek counsel in our need. It's also why we talk about rhythm of prayer and spiritual reading in the church and so on. And stories of faith and our gospel today also can help sustain us. And they point us to a bigger picture or a future direction. A few weeks ago, I mentioned Rabbi Jonathan Sachs in a sermon. And again, I want to draw from something he says in that book called Morality, published just before his death, in nine, after his death, in uh, 2020. Uh, Rabbi Sachs writes about Yisrael Kristal, a man who died in August 2017, and he was just short of his 114th birthday. Israel was a Holocaust survivor. He was liberated from Auschwitz as a walking skeleton with his entire world destroyed, as you can imagine. He married another Holocaust survivor, tells uh, Rabbi Sachs, and ended up running a confectionery business in Haifa in Israel. Israel and all Holocaust survivors were victims of one of the worst crimes against humanity in all of history but they did not survive with that victim mindset, quite the reverse. Instead, they survived, says Rabbi Sachs, because they did not look back, but looked forward to a future direction. And that was always their new starting point. Well, the source of this perspective for Yisrael Kristal was also stories of faith. Especially, uh, Jonathan Sachs refers to the story of Abraham and Sarah, known to us all. This was part of the foundational faith uh, for Jewish people. Again and again, stories such as this, foundational stories, grounded many who, like Sarah and Abraham, walked a difficult path in life, like Israel Kristal. Yet the promised vision, a sense of a future direction, guided their lives and prevented them from falling back to being victims. So with Abraham and Sarah, uh, Jonathan Sachs outlined some of this story, which will be familiar to us. But you might recall they were given promises, assurance, the covenant said, of children, land and parenthood of nations in Genesis chapter 17. But interestingly for them, nothing seemed to happen and even at the age of 137, the story tells us um, their only son was remained unmarried. And then Sarah died and Abraham didn't even own a plot of land. He bought a plot of land, though, to bury her. This was the first land he bought or owned within the Holy Land. But then the story goes on to tell us how Israel found a wife. Abraham married, remarried and had six sons. And so, the story goes, he became the parent of nations. And we should also mention Hagar and her offspring as well, that added to the sense of Abraham's fatherhood or destiny 
promised by God. Well, this is a story from which Israel Christal drew upon to move out beyond his suffering to the bigger world and to be a person who gave and, as we know, lived a long life. Well, today's story, uh, the gospel story, is a similar story, though also a tragedy. It is surely a story of a victim, but this is not how Mark tells it, nor the gospel, nor what the gospel will have us believe. Mark will not allow us to see John as a victim. If we ask, why does Mark choose to tell us this story? Then we can see that John's life and death is one with the movement toward a future destination, the reign of God in our world, including in the very courts of governors and kings. But this path is not and was not easy for John. The story of the death of John is not an aside. It's not just one story along the way to talking about the death of Jesus. Rather, Mark is telling the story because there is something about it that is very much a portal into the whole story of God and to us as listeners to this story, it is an eye-opener to that way. We can see this because Mark places this story straight after the account of the commissioning and the, ascend, descend, and the sending of the disciples. The story of John the Baptist then underlines what Mark wants his listeners to know, the costly nature of discipleship. As one biblical scholar notes, John's death was the end of innocence for Jesus' mission. This is not about feel-good religion. For Mark, the frame of reference, as with John the Baptist, is always God's future direction. That will enable readers of this account, including us, to move beyond ourselves, to beyond our sense of victimhood at any point of life, so as to live through hard times with a sense of hope and even joy. In this way, we may see glimpses of Satan falling, as Luke chapter 10 says, glimpses of evil overcome, called out or uncovered or undone. This is still a costly calling. That is the future direction, though, that drew John toward his death. Not a nice death, but a good death, knowing he was faithful to the life of God in his world. There's another reason why Mark's account of John's death is no interlude. For Mark, John's beheading was a precursor to the passion of Jesus. This helps us understand that the importance of Jesus' death is in great part because he stands in solidarity with John, but therefore with all who are marginalised and victimised in the process of standing up for justice and the love of God. John's story, including his beheading, is one with the events of Jesus' life. But this becomes clearer really only after the whole Christ event, after his life, death and resurrection. As with prophets of old, so with John and Jesus. If the love and justice of God is to be lived and proclaimed, then lack of love and injustices will be called out or shown up for what they are, negation of human well-being and the attempted negation and misrepresentation of God. And it may be that the consequences of this faithful life will be rejection and loss in some way if we take this path. Loss of prestige, loss of income, even at times loss of life, as with John and Jesus, but also with many Christians down the angels end, no less in places like Syria today, where being standing up for one's faith really does have a cost. Now, Rabbi Sachs finally points out that there are victims, and this we know, and we may well have been one. There is injustice and oppression, inequality and exclusion, and in the past, and perhaps even now, Whole groups, Jews, Blacks, Indigenous, Islanders, Gypsies, women, homosexuals, transsexuals, have all found themselves subjugated, marginalised, ill-treated and ignored. Those injustices must be fought and ended 
writes Rabbi Sachs. Truthfully also, this is quite a heavy calling upon us. Nevertheless, it is a calling that draws us out from any sense of our own victimhood to look toward the other. Truthfully though, we also may need counsel, and don't forget this, or spiritual direction. We need help, quite often, to move to this sense of a bigger picture beyond ourselves. And it's why we keep speaking of establishing a rhythm of prayer and spiritual reasoning or seeking the wisdom from others. John the Baptist is a stark reminder of the cost of discipleship, but at heart, discipleship draws us beyond being or remaining victims. Discipleship calls us into being who we are in God, calls us to that future direction, the future of God. Israel Kristal and many other Holocaust survivors were drawn to a fuller life because of the larger frame of that future direction. They did not remain victims. For the disciples of Jesus, that larger frame is the frame of God and the Christ who leads us to stand with victims so that they too might be drawn to the fuller life and future. Now let me finish with this beautiful prayer. Loving Eternal, you alone are our true judge. For you know what we are. You know what we should be. And with you there is mercy. Give us feeling for what is right. Set us on fire to see that right is done.